We're here with Professor Richard Balcom, who is uh, emeritus from St. Andrews University in Scotland and now resides in Cambridge. And um, we're here to talk a little bit about his own personal journey into being a biblical scholar and uh, how that really happened. I, I assume, Richard, you, you grew up in the Anglican Church? I did, yes, mm -hmm. yes. Was there a time when you thought about you were going to pursue ordination? And, and no, I never felt a call to the ministry. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the reasons I didn't do theology at university. Mm -hmm. If someone had told me you could do theology at university without intending ministry, I think I would probably have done it. Um, so in fact, what I did was history at university. Okay. Um, so I did a history degree in Cambridge, um, which I have never regretted, and I think in a way must have been providential because it gave me a very hard, a ve very good training in historical method right. from some, you know, some famous leading historians mm -hmm. um, of different periods. Um, so it was a very good grounding in, in history, which is you know, essential for biblical studies, as, as, as right. you know. And I went on to do a PhD in Cambridge in history, but there was a lot of theology in it, right. the study of a late 16th century English theologian. Um, which one? A uh, man called William Fulk, F-U-L-K-E. Okay. Yes. Okay. No one's ever heard of him, in spite of the fact that I wrote a PhD on him. Um, <laughs> but he was an interesting guy. Um, but I was, I'd, I, I'd been a keen Christian from teenage years onwards, right. and an intellectual sort of guy, so I was always interested in Bible, and right. doing a lot of really sort of amateur New Testament study, really, in terms mm -hmm. of reading commentaries and all this kind of thing. Um, and uh, a man who greatly helped me at Cambridge was Charlie Mull, great New Testament right. uh, scholar of that period who mm. identified my interest in New Testament and obviously saw that this was kind of promising and, and encouraged me mm -hmm. and invited me along to his research seminars when I was really still a historian. Mm -hmm. um, but I never did a degree in theology, which shocks people sometimes, you know. Um, but uh, I think I picked up all that along the way. Um, I think you did. <laughs> <laughs> I believe that did happen somewhere <laughs> along the line. Were you involved in Tyndale House in its I early was, days? Yes, I was quite, quite often at Tyndale House. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Uh, yes, that was a great place in Cambridge where people got together. I mean, I learned some of my biblical scholarship over coffee in Tyndale House, um, as, uh, as people often do. It, it um, still is the evangelical crossroads in that whole part oh, of the world. Yes, and that's right. anybody it trundles through it. Exactly, point. yes, yes, so. yes. And the coffee sessions are famous. You know, mm -hmm. People write books and in their prefaces they say, you know, they give thanks to the people they spoke over coffee with their project while they were working on it. Preventing me from numerous errors in the writing of this book. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. yes, yes. So yes. when you left Cambridge, I mean, what was your first job? Uh, well, I, sp I had a year's temporary lectureship in Leeds, and then I was 15 years in Manchester in the northwest of England, right. where I was teaching historically contemporary theology. So I was still not teaching biblical studies, um, and, and th I mean, theology was a great interest of mine alongside biblical studies. Sure. Um, but I was doing quite a lot of research work and publishing in biblical studies during that period. And then after 15 years in Manchester, it seemed the right point at which to kind of switch my actual teaching field mm -hmm. and, and kind of emphasis in what I was doing. I've always tried to keep up both some theology and sure. some biblical studies because I think it's important some people do both and try to put them together, you know. Um, but um, after 15 years in Manchester, it seemed the way, th way my work was going, it made sense uh, to take a job in New Testament studies. And that's the point at which I got the chair in, in St. Andrews in Scotland. And right. then I was 15 years in St. Andrews. You know, and those were certainly different days because nowadays if your degree is not in the speciality, in a lot of places in the world, they certainly just wouldn't hire you no. for a job no, like that no, anymore. Exactly. Whereas the British system was more open in regard it, to it, who it, it was, and I guess it wasn't quite so competitive. You know, there were, weren't candidates with quite such a list of publications already before they applied right. for their first right. job as there are now. And one didn't have to hang around with temporary jobs before you got a job the way so many people do now. Yeah. Well, I was stunned. I mean, when I went to the University of Durham, I was stunned to discover that Barrett didn't have a proper DPhil. No, no, no. At all. No, that's right. That, uh, by my time, you did have to have a DPhil, a PhD, right. to, to get a job in, in any academic field. But not long before that, it's quite true, there are people who got jobs, and what was the point of doing a PhD? They'd already got a, a, a right. permanent job, you know. Right. Um, and of course, they, they did the work and published books, but they published books rather than having to work on a PhD. It was, yes, it was just a bit before my time, the PhD became, a, as it were, kind of the essential training for being an academic. Right. But it was a fairly recent development. Mm -hmm. 
Where did where did your interest in Moltmann come into mm -hmm, the picture? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That was while I was still at Cambridge, towards the end of my time at Cambridge. I read Moltmann's Theology of Hope very soon after it came out in English translation. Yeah. Um, and I just found it an incredibly exciting experience. Yeah. Um, just a, you know, one of those kind of theological experiences that I remember still, you know, the, yeah. the, 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 the sort of enlightenment and stimulation. Actually, that's one of the things I've always thought about Moltmann. I don't always agree with him. I always find him stimulating, you know. Um, I had actually, this is interesting, I had the same experience reading Moltmann's The Crucified oh God yes. in seminary mm -hmm. about the same time you were having mm -hmm. this experience. Yes, yes. Yeah. And I got really excited mm -hmm. because he was coming to Andover Newton and being at Gordon Conwell in Boston, that's just up the road. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, 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 I trundled off to Andover Newton to mm -hmm. hear him, mm -hmm. you know, because I, I, I found this enormously yes. exciting, yes. this yes. whole yes. deep, rich theological reflection absolutely. on what's at the heart yes. of the Christian faith. Absolutely. Very creative at that stage. Right. You know, right. yes. has, his book has had an enormous influence, or well, both of those, Theology of Hope and Crucified absolutely. God. Absolutely. Two of the great, two of the most influential theological books of their period, I, right. I would say. But so I, I just sort of followed that, followed it up and, uh, uh, you know, kept up with Mortman's work as he continued to publish all sorts of things. And at Manchester, I regularly taught a course on Maltman, mm -hmm. um, small seminar group. We read the we read the major books together, so you know I, I got very familiar with his thought, and then I published some some work. My my first book, he commented that he thought I knew his thought better than he does. <laughs> <laughs> and what he meant was, he, what he said was, you know, that I had sort of tracked his thought and wrote a book talking about how it developed. The trajectory. Where, whereas he was always concerned with the next thing he was going to write. He didn't bother to look right, back like right. that. You know. yeah. um, but yeah. that, that, that was rather nice. I did, yeah. One of the things that certainly characterized your work is a profound interest in the neglected field of early Jewish Christianity. Yes, indeed. Yes. Starting with the brothers of Jesus and yes. working forward in time and yes. how in the wake of the Reformation really with this huge concentration on Paul, yes. There's been a neglect of what I would call the trunk end of the canon, whether it's Peter or James or Jude or the Book of Revelation in yes, various yes, ways. And yes. um, w what really prompted you to uh, develop such a keen and long-standing interest and publishing interest in that whole area? Yes, it really started with the commentary on Two Peter and Jude that I wrote, right, which was really my first New Testament publication. The word biblical the commentary. The word biblical commentary on Two Peter and Jude, um, which I enormously enjoyed writing because you. I think you could probably say they are the most neglected books in the New Testament. Absolutely. You're among all the, what, what someone called the little books at the back, you know, they're the, they're right. the least, least considered uh, books. And so it was a great thing to do as a young scholar to write a commentary on books where you didn't feel overwhelmed, you know, by the weight of scholarship right. on those books and all the great commentaries. Um, you know, I think I wrote what was then the longest commentary anyone had ever written on Two Peter and right. Jude. Mm -hmm. It was no longer than many commentaries on Paul and so on. You know, oh, no. Just that those books were so neglected. So, um, and I, uh, I had very much, I, you mentioned Moulton's Theology of Hope. You see, I was very interested in apocalyptic eschatology, that kind right, of field. Right, right. My first choice for doing a commentary in that series would have been Revelation. But of course, I was much too young a scholar at that stage for them right. to give me Revelation. Yeah. So, Two Peter and Jude was a bit of a consolation prize, but it turned out very, very good. I mean, I. I I very much enjoyed working on it. It was my training, in a way, in, in commentary writing. You right. Know? And I, th I think commentary writing, as you must know, you've written so many of them, is a great discipline, isn't it? It you is. Know? John Robinson once said he'd never written a commentary and didn't want to, because you have to say something about everything if you write a commentary. Right. But the other way of looking at uh, that is a great discipline to have to say something about everything. You know, you have to You learn a lot in the process. Exactly. Well, w and that, that commentary, I mean, any commentary sees, series is uneven. That yes. one, was, that series was particularly uneven. Mm -hmm. But yours had a huge impact, mm -hmm. partly because it filled a niche yes, that, I think that right. hadn't really been done very well thoroughly yes. before. I think that's right. Did did the writing of that commentary for you and the response, which I presume was mainly positive mm -hmm. to the commentary, mm -hmm. did that sort of set you on this path of? Well, let's look at more of this early Jewish apocalyptic stuff. Yes, indeed. Um, and Jude, you see. Uh, uh, actually, I, I then wrote a book called Jude and the Relatives of Jesus right. in the Early Church. I so remember. it got me into the idea of the, the role that the family of Jesus played in the early church. Mm -hmm. And that um, led me on to James, of course. Right. Um, and inevitably also into early Jewish Christianity. Um, 
So apocalyptic early Jewish Christianity, and, and my interest in the uh, non-canonical Jewish literature, uh, those sort of came together in various sure. ways, you know, interconnected. Um, well, yes. the one publication I know where you see, where you see both his, your strong theological interest and your exegetical interest is in fact in that James commentary mm. where you're talking about not just James but Kierkegaard of yes. all things. Yes, yes. That yes. How, how did you decide, land on putting those two things together? Well, James was Kierkegaard's favorite New Testament book. Really? Um, I, I don't think I've ever come across any, anyone else famous, you know, who had James as their favorite New right. Testament book. So he wrote a lot about it and reflected on it, wrote sermons, very interesting stuff. Um, and I wanted to, I mean, I did some uh, uh, good historical exegesis, I think, of James, but I wanted the book to be a bit broader, you know, right. to explore right. implications of James. So Kierkegaard was a nice kind of study of someone to whom James had been very important and what had he made of it. Right. So that was the idea, really, yes. And I find Kierkegaard, I mean, Kierkegaard's an extraordinary writer, isn't he? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But it, that actually says a lot about Kierkegaard. Yes. I mean, the book, yeah. The Purity of Heart is to yes. will the one thing. Yes. And yes. That surely comes right out of it, James. It, it, it does indeed. And of course, Kierkegaard was reflecting, uh, I mean, he was reacting against a sort of degenerate Paulinism, wasn't he, in the, in the Lutheranism right. of his day? Oh, absolutely. You know, a sort of justification by faith which says, you know, Plus that, nothing. It, it's easy. Yeah, that's right. So, right. so James was a counterweight to that. Right. Um, and of course, James had been so neglected in the, in the Lutheran tradition since Luther had called it an epistle of straw. Exactly. You know, um, and uh, that had a hard, because the Lutheran German tradition is so influential mm -hmm. on New Testament scholarship, that sort of denigration of James, I think, had a long influence, which only fairly recently, I think, have New Testament scholars really escaped entirely from that sense that James is really not very interesting or even even quite misleading and that kind of Well, I mean, you still see that in some of the great scholars that have influenced you and me, like Martin Hingle. Indeed, yes. You know, I yes. mean, the, the Tubigen crowd, Schumacher mm. and Hingle and Otto Betts and mm. those folks, I mean, you'd still hear resonances of mm. up with Paul and down yes, with yes. James, yes, yes, you know, yes. in various yes. ways. Yes. Yes, German scholarship is, is very Pauline. I have nothing against Paul, but there are other things in the New Testament as well as well, Paul. Right. You know. um.